In the moonlit embrace of rural Victoria, the decadent town of Buckley beats with a hidden heartbeat, the sanctuary of free-willed kindred. An anarch haven since the gold rush, Buckley's shadows hold secrets, its nights untamed. Yet the looming spectre of the Camarilla now threatens the delicate balance. As long-forgotten feuds simmer, a group of neonates bound by loyalty and survival find themselves at the epicentre of a power struggle. The Camarilla's tendrils tighten and Buckley teeters on the brink of open war. Welcome to the Dance of Shadows in Buckley, where the Anarch flame flickers against the encroaching night, a tale of defiance, politics, and the seductive allure of eternal power. This is Creatures Such As We. A Vampire the Masquerade 5th Edition Actual Play Podcast, presented by DM Fiat. I am your storyteller, Dale or DG, and tonight I shall be your guide through this hidden and treacherous world of darkness. Welcome back, my dear little monsters. No, that's combat music. <laughs> that's the wrong music. Let's try that again. Three, two, one. That was. That's if we're gonna start. We start in media res. You're already in Mr. O's van, and he's coming for you. All right. (laughs) Three, two, one. Let's go. Welcome back, my little monsters. Creatures such as we begin to awaken as the deep, dark night of the Australian outback blankets the little city of Buckley, and your stolen blood begins to animate your gelid corpses. As you awaken tonight, there is one thing on your mind, and that is the certainty, the absolute certainty that tonight is going to be one of the longest, most important, and perhaps most dangerous nights of your undead existence thus far. You've taken two members of the Camarilla captive, the Sheriff, Richard, and his hound, the Nosferatu Savoy. They were unexpected variables. Your initial plan was to get Mr. O's location, track him down, and find out where Wisteria's sire Thaddeus can be found. But now, You've got two captives waiting to be interrogated, and they must be interrogated soon, tonight, immediately. For if they're not released very soon, if they do not return to their cam masters, you risk turning this cold war into something much more dangerous. Then, of course, there's the wayward ghoul, Mr. O, Orson Forrest. Sequestered away, safe, he thinks, in a nondescript workman's van driving a predetermined route through the Camarilla portions of the city. You've got to find a way to ambush him, take him, and interrogate him too. Find out where Thaddeus hides, how you can get to him, and how you can get the upper hand. So, let us begin with Avelina first, who I have a small vignette for to start with. Avelina, as you awaken tonight, go ahead and make a rouse check for me, and we'll see if you get any hungrier. Okay. I need to get used to using a dice and sell the fucking dice in person. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, was it 2d10 again? For a rouse check, just 1d10, and if it's 6 or above, then you don't get hungrier. It was a success! Success! So what hunger are you currently at, Avelina? 
I believe I'm at one. I need to change between my screens. Yeah, I'm at one from your You've start been doing last well. Time. You've been conserving your powers, you've been exercising restraint. And so as you awaken tonight in Avelina's bedroom of her ancestral manor, the Ashford Manor, as she pulls away the covers of her luxurious four-poster bed, as she steps across the room and the satin nightgown slides away and she puts on her Wednesday Adams dress, stands in front of the mirror and makes sure her hair is in just the right spot. The beast is mysteriously quiet tonight. Oh, it's not gone. It's never gone. It's always there lurking in the background, creeping like a cat getting close to feeding time. But... But it seems to be sated. Perhaps all of that chaos, all of that action last night that got your blood pumping, that got everyone's blood boiling, has satisfied it. At least for now. Avelina, as you're making your way out of your bedroom, you happen to be crossing the dining hall of Ashford, estate. The dining hall is a large central chamber of the manor. It's large enough that you could probably fit a small one or two bedroom suburban flat into just this one dining room and the whole expanse of the dining room is taken up by a long mahogany dining table with at least 24 chairs and places set and marked for the staff who will soon be sitting down with your father for the evening meal. The staff are running back and forth, to and fro, the chef busying himself, others helping him juggle condiments and plates and cutlery, and whenever one of them passes you by, they look in your direction and smile. A smile of deferred respect, but also genuine care. These people watched you grow up, and they watched you become something else. One of them, the chef, immediately stops in his tracks. He begins to pull down his right sleeve, bearing his wrist. And as is routine, he offers it to you, holding it up. My lady, taking a bow as he does so. Oh, thank you. I'll take a bite. Not particularly hungry, but you don't want to let him down. You want to reward him for his faithful service, and so you take a little nibble, a couple of drops. It's enough to make the beast perk up, prick its ears in attention, and invigorate you. A little micro-dose of fresh vitae, and it's enough to send ecstasy flooding down the chef's facial features. They fall lax, and he shivers, <laughs> and he says, oh, Thank you, my lady. Your father, uh, your father said he wanted to see you. Uh, directly, you were out of bed. Uh, you shouldn't keep him waiting. He gives you a curtsy mm. and scurries away. No problem. Guess I need to go find my father. If Search for him in his usual place, his upstairs study. You step into the study and you find him as expected, reclining in front of a roaring fireplace. There are trophies, grand trophies on the walls, deer heads. Many different deer heads, a long, thick snake. Even a freshwater alligator, perfectly preserved and posed above the mantel mantelpiece. I always loved this room. And yet, and yet with that roaring fireplace, you don't step very far over the threshold. Seeing those flames dancing, the twisted shadows they cast on the wall, your beast reaches out, grabs your heartstrings with its hands, and forbids you from taking a step further. But it's enough. It's enough to signal your father's attention. 
he revolves in the reclining chair and smiles as he sees you standing in the doorway. Ah, Evelina, he says. Hi, uh, I thought you would be rushing out as soon as you awoke. I, uh, glad someone was able to catch you before you ducked out. Uh, listen, uh, this, yes, uh, um... He pauses as he takes in your body, your pale skin, the fangs peeking out from your lips. And he says, your secret. You need to make sure nobody is watching you. You need to make sure nobody is following you. I have a very bad feeling, my daughter. A bad feeling indeed. And I know if others of your kind were to find out that all of us here in this home know what you are and work to advance your schemes, there would be trouble, not just for us, but for you. You've impressed this upon me many times i tried to call you last night he says i rang the club and the bartender said you were out you'd gone out with special friends he said something most important and that Indeed. you wouldn't be back for the rest of the night and, and and i confess i'd already retired for bed by the time you returned i was so hoping to catch you avelina Evelina, who have you told about the arrangement we have here? In the house? No one. No one? And you're absolutely sure? From what I can recall, yeah. He frowns reaches into the folds of his purple dressing gown, fishes out his phone, glances at the screen. Hmm. Someone wanted to talk to you last night, Avelina. They came here, knocked on the door of the house. A man by the name of Jensen said he was a journalist, a writer, said he was working on something about the history of the town, and that he had some particularly juicy tips about our family. And of course, he said anyone writing any treatise on the history of Buckley would need to talk about the Ashford family. We are, after all, not a footnote in the history of this town. We go way back, way back to the gold rush. But So I thought, I thought he just wanted to clear up, you know, the names of some of our founders, understand the history of our business, the manufacturing, the gold rush, the mining, but no. Avelina, he mentioned your name. He wanted to speak to you. Said he'd heard something and he needed to hear the response straight from your mouth before he could put it down in his article. He said you'd be most interested, and he said, and he said, I quote him exactly, Miss Ashford would not want would want nothing more than to address the outlandish rumors that have been leveled against her. I, I, I don't know who would have even talked to anyone. You've been pretty quiet about everything. It could be, could be he wants to ask you something innocuous, something about your fashion sense. Uh, God knows that gets so many eyes, <laughs> so many eyes on you every night. But something about the way he said it and the hairs on the back of my neck rankled. I managed to tell him you weren't here and he said he would try again another time. But I wanted you to be aware of it and hopefully should he... Knock on the door again. You'll be here to talk to him yourself. Either that, or he can find you at the club. I just wanted to let you know so you could be careful. Do you understand? Yes. Thank you for letting me know. But that does bring in the question of 
Is there anyone within this house who has also leaked some secrets? All of the staff here, what is it you've taken to referring to them as? Your herd. You said they were hand-picked because you trusted them. I trust everyone who works here. They've been in this family's employ for generations. Their families are as entwined with our own as you and I are. Are you telling me that one of them has betrayed our trust? I would hope not, but it doesn't mean we can't keep our ears up, does it? I'll certainly be keeping my ears out and my eyes too, he says. Just, uh, just focus on this journalist for the time being. Should he find you, should you speak to him, you'll, uh, well, you'll know to be very careful and try to disabuse him of whatever outlandish rumours are floating around in his head. Hmm. Now, uh, I understand you have something important to attend to tonight. Mm -hmm. So I'll let you be on your way, my daughter, but... He pauses just as you turn to leave. He raises a hand to signal for you to wait. And then he says, Just uh, for the sake of my own peace of mind, Avelina. Yes, father. The things you're involved in. Now, I won't claim I know anything about the world that you live in, but... I worry, you know, you are my daughter, and you came home so uncomfortably late last night. Ten minutes after you crossed the threshold, the sun was already up and in the sky. And so, I will advise you, as I have done for generations, as I did when you were a little girl, Evelina, as a member of the Ashford family, be very careful whose company you keep for there is a lot of wealth and prestige attached to our name we only keep the company of those who are required to be company with if you trust them if you are sure they are of use to you and that they are not in turn taking advantage of your good grace and hospitality and the ashford name then i trust you he says, smiling. He peers back down into the flames. Now, you'd best not keep uh, whoever's waiting for you on tenterhooks. Go check her phone. <laughs> <laughs> you reach down, Evelina. Pull out your phone, and sure enough, there's a message from Wisteria on there. It's addressed to everyone in the Coterie, and it simply says, Okay, we've got stuff to do. Meet at the usual spot. You smile, slide the phone back into the folds of your dress, and you're gone. <laughs> Rest of the Coterie. There's a busy night ahead of you. An interrogation, an ambush, and you haven't fed Aside from that procurement you did for Desiree last night, you haven't had a chance to do any proper hunting. And some of you may be finding yourselves ground down to a fine powder tonight. So let's see how you're starting tonight. Wisteria, Gil, Barry, go ahead. And Robert too. Go ahead and make me rouse checks to see if you awaken tonight hungrier than before. Wisteria does not get hungrier. Neither does Barry. Neither does Barry. Barry still somehow at zero. <laughs> we stay fed. Stay fed. Barry did a lot last night. Barry pulled his weight a lot. He took names. He kicked ass. And maybe that's enough to keep the beast quiet like a petulant child tonight. And Wisteria indulged in her fair share of action, too. Wisteria, you are injured at the moment, I believe. Yes. But there's no time for that. She left directions for Jan, and she calls her retainer, her ghoul, to see if they've been completed. Was Mr. Uh, were the two captives taken to the sex hotel, dressed up in gimp suits? 
what are the hot where are the high priced art objects brought out from the warehouse and taken there as well? What was the entire ring rented? rented? You demand all of these questions from Jan while while your touchstone, Glenda, rushes to and forth in the background, pouring drinks for the two of you, taking inventory of the new stock, dusting the shelves, making the shop look presentable. Jan nods silently at each and every of these questions. Jan finishes by raising in their hand an old Nokia phone. One of the very first models with a camera phone and showing you on the screen the grainy, threadbare, almost incoherent image of both Savoy and Richard tied to chairs in that dusty motel basement surrounded by wooden crates and cardboard boxes, both of them still torpid with stakes securely in their chests. Well done. I took Good some extra precautions. I took some extra precautions, of course, says Jan. Uh, not normal rope. That is, that is industrial strength binding. Eve, should the stakes be ripped out, uh, they'll have to spend some of their blood at least to get free. And I don't believe they should have a lot of blood floating around in those veins of theirs after all that went down last night. Excellent. Says Wisteria, we'll have to get them out of here quickly afterwards. Oh, it's going to cause the Camarilla to become very stupid if they don't get back on the streets fast. All right. Indeed, and, says Jan, nodding. Luckily, she, that's beyond my pay grade. It certainly is. Take the day off. You've earned it. Glenda takes uh, the teacup off the, the tray that Glenda proffers, drains it, and then places it back down. If you need me, you know where to find me, says Jan. Of course. Before they turn and are out the door. And she taps on the phone. Change of plans. Meet at this address instead. Mm. Don't dress too swanky. So, Gil, Barry, Gil, how did you go on your rouse check as you awakened tonight, by the way? Ah, the beast next door still screeches his name. So Barry, as you shuffle into consciousness in the back seat of your car, which tonight you've chosen to park under an old railway bridge, away from the eye line of anyone driving past on the nearest main road. As the memories of last night flood through your brain, the first thing you are aware of is your phone vibrating furiously and you look down Barry and you see the message from Wisteria meet at the motel we're interrogating our captives and yet also in the back of your mind Barry you can still see that flash that vision that Desiree granted you when you grabbed Mr. O's handkerchief you could still see that nondescript work van driving its route through northern buckley waiting to be ambushed and that's what you thought you were going to be doing upon awakening tonight what do you think barry interrogation first or mr o first hmm i i'm wondering I don't know if you'll... I don't know if this is possible at all, and if you allow me to retroactively do this. Um, if I can activate Unerring Pursuit through a vision? I would say that having that handkerchief in your possession, with Desiree's blood magic still working across it, the traces of her magic still there, I'd say that's enough to get unerring pursuit to work, to create that connection between you and Mr. O. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll put, I'll, I'll definitely, I'll activate my unerring pursuit. Um, now go, go ahead, make a rouse check for me. Okay, <laughs> Barry finally gets some hunger. Finally gets some hunger. 
It's because the beast senses that you're hunting, looking for someone, and it stirs with relish, knowing that whenever you're looking for someone, there is always the chance of bloodshed, and that excites it. So you go up to Hunger 1. Go ahead and roll me Resolve plus Ore Specs, please. And do. Ooh, baby. Uh, that's a five. You close your eyes and the back seat of Barry's car disappears. It's replaced with the back of a otherwise unremarkable white Toyota Hi-Ace work van. You can make out some of the landmarks through the window on the back, on the back door. An Otolli's restaurant, an old pub, a large mm. bank. Enough to get a very rough idea about which neighbourhood the van is currently moving through. Mr. Rowe sits in the back, silent, contemplating, watching the city go by through the window, while someone else is hunched over the steering wheel in the front seat, driving, not speaking, not taking their eye off the road. And through Mr. O's eyes, you see that the driver is ready for any trouble. You can just see the hilt of a snub-nosed police revolver in a shoulder holster, under the brim of their coat. Not anyone I'd recognise. Doesn't appear to be anyone you'd recognise, at least not from the back of their head, but the way they drive, the way they don't take their eyes off the road, tells you all you need to know. This is someone who takes their job seriously. This is a professional. A hired gun, if you ever saw one. You shake your head, and once again you're dropped back into your own car. To O will be there all night, you think. You send a message back to Wisteria, replying in the affirmative, and then the engine of Barry's car, come haven, roars to life, and he screams off into the darkness to meet with Wisteria. Gil! You're back from the beast next I'm door back. <laughs> to confront the real beast in Gil's head. Let's see if you're awakening oh, yeah. tonight any hungrier. Go ahead, make me a rouse check. Not currently. He's doing all right. He's got hunger too from uh, from last night. Um, and I do need to make another hung rouse check to see if he heals. Mm, yes. Are you going to attempt to heal your aggravated damage? Certainly am. Well, no. One. A, sing a single point of aggravated damage in V5 requires three rouse checks. So, go ahead. Let's see how much... How much the beast is going to demand blood when all is said and done. Hopefully, being at Hunger 2, hopefully those three checks all don't prove to be failures and put you up to Hunger 5. That would be disastrous. No, it puts you up to Hunger 3. Uh, two successes and a failure. Mm. You clutch your shoulder and you feel the burnt flesh begin to peel and drop off and twist and knit and churn and stitch itself back together. The pain is still strong. You wince with every movement you take. You hiss and grit your teeth as the tip of your finger touches your shoulder. A single point of aggravated damage. Do you want to risk healing any more? Um, I don't think so. I think he's he'll be good enough to let uh, Abby fuss over him for a little bit and put bandages yeah. on him. I'm sure she'll be very worried about him. Uh, and he'll pseudo-reluctantly let her do it. It'll be grumbling, but, you know, sure, if it makes you feel better. Sits you down in a chair and she fusses. Oh, oh dear. Oh, my love. Oh, you should be more careful. Oh, don't... Don't get involved with people like that. I I've told you before, that's dangerous. And... 
and I know you, you wouldn't hurt a fly, but these people, these people you're messing with, they would. They're, they're nasty people. And even knowing that nothing she does will help, even knowing that the alcohol she drops on the wound won't cleanse it, even knowing that the bandages do absolutely nothing to dead, unliving flesh, you let her do it. You let her fuss over you, and then as soon as you feel that the bandage is tight, you stand up, look at her, say, thanks, doll, and begin walking towards the door of the room, ready to begin your night's activities. It, 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 it's okay, she says, faltering. Just, uh, please, uh, please, uh, if you're gonna be out late like that again, if you're gonna, if you're gonna pick fights, at least give me a call. I sat up here all night, worrying, and I, I... She trails off. I'll see what I can do. I've got stuff to do tonight. Don't don't you worry. You uh you stay here, just chill, relax, everything's fine. She nods and then she looks around the cluttered apartment and she says, Uh I'll do a big cleanup while you're gone. Make sure it's nice and spick and span when you come back. Big surprise. Oh well, it's not a surprise now that I've told you, is it? <laughs> She looks over her shoulder into the kitchen where a pot she's got on the stove loudly clangs and then she rushes off to attend to the dinner, the candlelight dinner that even after all these years she's convinced herself that you'll still have with her. She just has to catch you on the right night and then you're gone. And finally, Robert. Robert. <laughs> The Hive, the man of a thousand different minds. You've got a lot to do tonight, but first we'll see how hungry you are. Go ahead, make a rouse check for me. Well, hopefully that's not indicative of things. Mm. Uh... Waking up hungrier tonight? Uh, no, I dropped my first die, but my oh. my successful roll was a success, so I don't actually so, get hungry. <laughs> do not get hungry. And how much? What is your hunger currently? Uh, do I'm still at one somehow, apparently. Still at one. You're all doing very well tonight. The only one who probably might want to risk hunting would be Gil. Of course, you know there's still a lot to happen. It's up to you to manage your blood. Keep in mind that you can choose to go hunting any time tonight, but when you do go hunting, you may potentially miss out on other things. Mr. O's out there waiting for you. Wisteria's sire is in hiding. You've got victims to interrogate. Any time you spend hunting will take away from the time you could spend doing those things. And you might potentially miss out on something, and that's when I'll take this chance to remind everyone that you all have at least one dot of herd that you've inherited from Mickey Mayhew. And once per story, you may make use of your herd to replenish that amount of hunger without having to roll or spend time hunting. You need only tell me that you're making use of it. Excellent. Mysteria will do that on the way to the sleazy hotel yes and i'll uh grab our bear of course i should have grabbed that already so robert <clears throat> as you awaken tonight the beast somehow pacified a rare occurrence perhaps anticipating how much action it's going to get later you're jerked out of unconsciousness by the sound of a loud electronic beeping your eyes are immediately drawn to the other room, the monitor room of the small security outpost on the very edge of Prospector's Peak. Your security system is ringing. It has detected an intruder. And so you pull yourself out of the little plastic disposable coffin that sits there on the dirty concrete floor. Hundreds of ants squirming over the plastic and over the floor. 
You make your way into the monitor room. You move past the big monitor set into the wall that at all times provides you with a constant feed of the mine shaft. You quickly ensure that she is safe, her, the queen, hanging there in the shaft, glistening grubs, thousands of them at her base, squirming over the scant remains of the poor urban explorers from the night before. And then your attention is drawn to the smaller monitor next to it. The one, the one linked to the camera that provides an overview of the Prospector's Peak entry, the main street, the old frontier town, the abandoned saloon, the gold Prospector's cabin, the leathermonger's shop and there parked at the edge of the main street is a victoria police cruiser even now as the security system beeps alerting you to his presence he climbs out of his car brandishing his service arm in his left hand a flashlight in the other he looks around peers down the main street and then calls out hello Anyone here? Police! This is the police! What you do, Robert? Uh, well, first, just let's have a resigned sigh. But I'll just... Monitor for now, because it's like... As far as this place is listed, no one's here. Do you make any attempt to disguise yourself? Uh, if he moves his way actually in, like, onto the premises, then I'll, then I'll probably obfuscate. Like, just, uh, what's the level one one? Watch just, like him. A, just cloak of shadows at first, just like, yeah, observe. You watch him at first, and he makes his way over to the saloon, peers in through the door, flashes the flashlight through, and you can see the beam of the flashlight through the little window that looks out onto the main street from the security shack. Hello! This is Victoria Police. If anyone's here, if there's any security staff, I just want to ask some questions. We've got a couple of missing persons reports. If anyone's there, please make yourself known. Mm -hmm. If right. left unchecked, he'll probably search the buildings. If he's particularly daring or if he has a warrant, he might set foot inside the mines. If he does, he'll probably be never heard from again. So you could simply sneak out under the cover of darkness, never have him even be aware that you're there, risk that he digs a bit too deep, and you have yet another missing person that someone will come to investigate, or perhaps... Perhaps you can find a way to turn him back. Up to you. Uh, well, I was initially having the thought of maybe, like, maybe Robert keeps it like his like one of his old uniforms or something as like a basic disguise. But even then, it's iffy at best. And also, he's not the best at lying. <laughs> Hmm, yeah. Especially given you're a Nosferatu and you're going to get two penalty dice just for him seeing your face if you don't disguise yourself. Talking this guy down is probably not what you're willing to do. And, and right now you can hear the voices of the ants in your head. The voice of the beast, the ants, one and the same. Let him come. He has no idea. We will welcome him if he does. And so you choose to just leave? Go ahead. Yeah. To activate your level one obfuscate. Go ahead and make me a dex plus stealth plus obfuscate check, please. Well, since I'm going to be... 
I know, yeah. Uh, so, Dex Stealth Obfuscate, you said, yeah? Yep, Dex Stealth Obfuscate. Yeah. How'd you go? Uh, that'll be a critical eight. Critical eight. <laughs> Hello, the cop calls out as he rolls five successes. He shudders oh. as you move past him, perhaps feeling the disturbance in the air. But when he whirls around, brandishing his gun and his flashlight, he sees naught but the empty, abandoned main street. Seeing things, he says under his breath. And as you creep away, hear him whispering into his radio. Uh, yeah, uh, copy that. Doesn't look like there's anyone here. I'm gonna search the buildings for any sign of them, and then I'm gonna come back to station. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, there's a mine shaft here, but, uh, would not be willing to enter without prior precautions. Uh, the whole place looks condemned. Yep, yep, copy that copy that and then you're gone and the cop this constable who by the skin of his teeth has been spared a fate worse than death has no idea that he's in the domain of a monster tonight all right gil barry evelina robert wisteria you're all on the way to that old motel that old motel that sheltered you from your enemies 30 years ago, a couple blocks away from Mysteria's shop in the Lakeside District, still thankfully now in Anarch territory. Would anyone like to hunt? Or would anyone like to make use of their herd on the way? I will use my herd. Mm, you use your herd? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think, uh, I think you can one, use herd as well. Herd as well? Yeah. Wisteria's um, already used that herd. Yep. And healed up. Avelina, you're at one hunger. Would you like to spend your three dots of herd to get automatic successes on the next two rouse checks you do? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Drinking deep tonight. Before Avelina steps out of the Ashford Manor, she motions for a couple of the faithful staff to come and join her in the back room. They roll down their sleeves, offer their wrists to her, and she drinks deeply. <laughs> Gil and Wisteria, you both arrive at Mickey Mayhew's rundown apartment block at the same time. You don't need to ask why you're here. It's clear from the look in each other's eyes, that red bloodshot look of hunger. You're here for one thing, and that is to feed. You give each other the bare minimum greeting, a quick nod, and then head inside the building. Gil... You're looking around, ready to rough someone up. You make your way up to the second floor and clench your fists as you're ready to bash down an apartment door and take someone inside. Take whoever's inside. And then... A lady with short blonde hair, about half a foot shorter than you, wearing a clean but out-of-season summer dress, looks over at you standing in the threshold of her own apartment door the doorway half open she studies you for a few moments and then clears her throat and once you have once she has your attention she steps out into the hallway and with a grim look of resignation on her face rolls up the sleeve of her dress Proffers both wrists to you, holding them out, closing her eyes to wait for the inevitable. Uh, if she's offering, Gil will go over there and he'll like, are, are you sure? Give she it a look, look like. She opens her eyes, looks up at you, somewhat confused. 
are you sure? She's never heard that before. She knows that you're like Mickey. She knows that even though Mickey's gone, you're the new master of this domain. And Mickey is the type of landlord who doesn't take rent in cash. She says, ah, I'm just, I'm just paying my due, she says, uh, unless you'd rather something else. No, no, come with me. And he'll, like, lead her inside into the privacy of her own home. Um, and he'll be gentle. Um, he's not going to be horrible about it. If she's offering, yeah. Uh, he'll, like, sit her down and treat her all nice. Um, and just take a, a single point's worth. She winces as you reach out to touch her, and you can tell, you can tell she's expecting you to be rough, to throw her against the wall or against the bed and bite her flesh like a rabid animal, drain her veins, leave her feeling under the weather, sick and tired and lethargic for weeks afterwards, but... But you don't. You're gentle. You sit her down at the kitchen table. You silently bring her wrist to your mouth and you feed. And in spite of the look of resignation on her face, you see her entire body tremble with ecstasy as you take her life force. And then you lick the wound closed. And smiling, you turn and leave, carefully shutting the apartment door behind you. You may reduce your hunger by one. Wisteria. Add, go ahead. Add something. Yeah, go ahead. Once Gil's gone, Wisteria fades into existence, holding up her phone camera. And she replays the footage she took of the woman offering something else and Gil following him back into the apartment. Mm. Then she just tucks it away for now. And then... She gets to work herself. Last time you were here, before this place was the Coteries, when it was indeed still Mickey's, there was an apartment you broke into. Yes. A man sleeping peacefully, perhaps a bit fitfully as you fed from him. You bathed yourself in his blood, in his memories, and you feel no need to try anyone different. Not when, not when you still remember how sweet his dreams, his memories were. And so you let yourself into that same apartment. Once again, the wife lies beside the man, unaware of there being anyone standing over them in the bedroom. The man moves fitfully, grunts in his sleep, moans, and turns over, unaware that anything was taken at all. Wisteria, reduce your hunger by one point as the... Sweet memories of Saturday barbecues, Arvo's watching the footy. This Taking time she the draws from the woman. This Ooh, time woman. she checks to see if that her dreams line up with his. Just reveling in the sensation of images and thoughts. Kindred don't dream. The blood is... This is the closest she'll come. Blood is sweet. The vitae is always sweet. The beast purrs as you drink it up, but the memories... The memories, not so much. Where the man dreamt of lazy arvos watching the footy, Saturday barbecues, time with the kids. Her dreams are filled with arguments about finances, about, about the new secretary at her husband's work, about the kids flunking school about him always being out at the footy, about the chores always needing to be done. She stirs fitfully, unaware that you've taken anything at all. And when she opens her eyes and awakens, jolted to wakefulness by a bad memory, sits up in the bed and looks around, you're already gone. And so, here we are. First order of business to tonight, of tonight. Well, first proper order of business. 
the hotel looks almost exactly the same as it was 30 years ago. Same garish neon sign, same dirty crowded concrete parking lot, same garish 1970s wallpaper visible in the lobby. The only addition in 30 years is a big gleaming yellow sticker in the front window that reads Wi-Fi available. But you're not here to book a room. Wisteria already knows where to go. She greets everyone as they approach and leads them past the front entrance of the motel towards the room. The same room that sheltered you all days, all those decades ago. The same room that for the last 30 years has been constantly rented out to an employee of Wisteria's Glenda Wagoner. And for the last 30 years has served as nothing more than an impromptu warehouse for all of the spillover that doesn't fit in Wisteria's shop. And you step inside the room and you find exactly what you expect to see. Mostly empty, save for wooden crates, cardboard boxes, objects of art with white dusty sheets thrown over them and there in the very center of the room each tied to a chair richard the toreador sheriff and savoy the nosferatu with the melted face both of them putrid gray stony torpid with stakes stuck in their chests each of them bound tightly with thick industrial rope even chain First thing first, Wisteria takes Savoy and puts him in a different room. Ah. Richard, first I'm thinking. Any objections? Doesn't seem he's, to be. Oh, he's a high down. priority. He's the one we need to get out of here fast. You grab Savoy's chair, drag it into the little run-down bathroom off to the side, pull the door shut behind him, and then gather around Richard. And as you do, I would like everybody to go ahead and make a wits awareness roll for me, please. Mm -hmm. Hmm, two. Two? And how'd everyone else go? Yeah, All same two. Successes. Two successes? Oh, how many did you get, Barry? Five. Five, ooh. Yeah. And Avelina Five and Robert? Two of them ooh, recruits. Avelina and Barry, definitely on the ball, and Robert. Mm. Uh, Robert got four. Four. Avelina and Barry, you're the ones who notice as, as Wisteria begins to lean down and as she wraps her fingers around the stake, as she's just about to pull you two, feel that all too familiar sense that you're being watched. Avelina and Barry, you whirl around, look over your shoulders, and there, in the corner of the room, standing hidden behind a stack of wooden crates, see the figure. Someone watching, waiting. Someone short. Someone hunched over. Someone who was, until just a second ago, obfuscated. But now, thanks to your keen awareness, reveals themselves to you. Barry immediately rushes at them. Pins them up against the wall. Evelina pulls out her knife hands. Knife hands? There we go. Evelina, go ahead, make me a rouse check. And Barry, go ahead and make me a strength brawl, please. Success. You do not get hungrier. Gil cracks his neck and gets ready to back up Barry. Just in case. Um, three successes. I also got a... Um, sorry, I have to keep... Here, 
um, when the skull shows up on the hunger dice, that's just immediate um, critical, like, um, No, no, that would be... So the skull is a zero, but it, the skull is a one, basically. It's a total failure. Oh, so as long as those only count if if there's no successes in the pool. So right. if there's no, okay. there's no successes in the pool and there's a skull on the hunger dice, that's a bestial failure. You're fine. How okay. many successes Great. altogether? Thank you. Uh, three successes. Three successes? Three successes to his three successes. He doesn't... He's not expecting you to rush him, that's for sure. He's not even aware you think that you know he's there. And so he only moves at the last possible second as Avelina's talons extend and as Barry rushes towards the corner. The figure shuffles at the moment. He reveals himself and in a split second you see a vaguely familiar deformed face with bat-like ears. He oh. extends a long he extends a long skeletal hand with barbed claws of his own and slashes your face, Barry, just as you grab him and shove him against the wall, and you take a superficial point of damage, but so does he. Hey, 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 hey! He calls out. Julian? Fuck. Yeah, me, Julian! Fuck, fuck! <sighs> rough. Julian. The fact that you're here means this is moving very quickly. Julian, you're free to ask some questions too, unless you'd prefer to be out of sight. What's your call? Oh, look! Uh, look, I wasn't planning to intrude, or, or, or I wasn't planning to cause any trouble at all. He raises both his hands as Barry still pins him to the wall. It's just that, uh, well, you know, I keep an eye on this place, like I did when okay. you stayed here all those years ago, and I saw, I saw that Jan of yours come in and out, dragging these two along with them, and, you know, I've heard, you know, I may be Anarch, but when you're Nosferatu as old as me, mm -hmm. sect ties don't really matter so much, and so I heard one of us had been taken, a hound, and a sheriff, and I thought it could only have been you guys. So I come here, sure enough, here they are, and I was just planning to sit here and listen and see what they had to spill, so I had some juicy gossip. I wasn't planning oh. to sell you up river or nothing. Julian, we're entirely fine with this. The Baron's going to get a phone call as soon as we start, for his own plausible deniability, so we were planning on including the Anarchs and anyway. <sighs> it doesn't make a difference if you're here or not, I suppose. Anyone disagree? No. We, so we can't hear them? No, but I do think that giving us for giving us such a fright and getting to listen in on such an interesting interrogation, you owe us a minor boon. Does that sound good, Julian? <laughs> Gals, as he looks towards the bathroom door, I'm mainly interested in him, Savoy. Oh, in that case, that's Nosferatu business. I wouldn't dare to intrude. That's between you and, uh, I point over at Robert. Sure, if you're content with me owing you a boon, uh, I'll happily listen to what the sheriff has to say. Could be a couple of choice bits of goss that I could sell, you know, to interested parties. But I'm mainly here because of that piece of shit. He gestures his thumb towards the bathroom. Him and I got beef from way back. Hmm. Is everyone all right with this arrangement? Gil kind of shrugs and... Sure, man. Yeah, Julian's cool. All right. Wisteria, well, you just said that party ties don't really matter to a Nosferatu as old as him. What's to stop him from selling stuff to the to the Camarilla? That is oh, a concern. Black. Sure, if I could get uh, within uh, 20 feet of Elysium without being... Uh, Utterly eviscerated, staked, ripped apart, decapitated. You know, the prince uh, has a blood hunt on all anarchs should they step into Cam Domain. So, he smiles. That said, there are go-betweens. Yes. That is true. Well, here's the thing. The answers we're going to get from this popped-up, puffed-up pot and pop and jay, she points at the sheriff, 
are things the Camarilla knows anyway, and things that would probably, at worst, screw him over, depending on how we interrogate him. So we, there's really not much you can't take to the Camarilla that they don't know already. That's my view on it. The other I thing is that if so... Simple. Well... Then we best not reveal too much of ourselves. And here's the thing, he's... He, this one, she points at the Torador, is going to be let go already, and he's damn well going to know that we interrogated him and overcame him, unless somebody's got the trick to do the long-term memories app. Indeed. Evelina, you have uh, a <laughs> memory, do you not? Yes, I do. The long-term memories app? The one that affects ours? Quite, the one, but she The could. one that works in other kindred? She would be able to, with her cloud memories, prevent them from knowing immediately who interrogated them, but they would still be aware of the fact that they've been interrogated, yes. Alright. Well, that's, that's our insurance. That's our insurance, then. Also, it occurs to me that it would be very foolish for Julian to sell us out, being as he will be the only one having this hot goss, as he so termed it. And if it comes back to haunt us on the camera... Well, aside, well, no. Hey, I did you. I did you a solid in your first you night. You did. He says I could have sold you out then, and I didn't. So you did, you know. and that's why you're not in torpor right now, Julian. Please spare like the you. spare the tough talk for your good pal, Julian. Okay? He flashes you a thumbs up. Works for me. I can't stay mad at you anyway. You've been a fairly decent sort as it goes. <clears throat> All right, does this adequately address your worries, uh, Barry, or would you prefer he be out of the room for the sheriff's interrogation? We'll give, I figure we'll give him the Nosferatu business either way, because it is Nosferatu business. I'm really, um, you know, open Barry's on either way to the... Barry's going to release him from the wall. He can do whatever he, he likes. Looks... He lets out an obvious sigh of relief as you let him down, and I would like you, Barry, to go ahead and make me a strength intimidate roll, just for the sake of something later. Just to see if you made an impression on him. Ooh. I might spend a willpower to roll three How do we do, Barry? I'm just spending a willpower. I have go ahead. Good idea. Ah, uh, three successes. Three successes. You hear him sigh in obvious relief. He quickly composes himself and he smiles and he says, See, like I said, no trouble. Instant death stare. He looks away from you squirming and, and Avelina, the Nosferatu with the bat ears, Julian. You've never seen him before. You get a good look at his face for the first time. He smiles and whispers appreciatively. Cool trick with the knife hands, by the way. Might want to keep those out just in case our friends here don't decide to be cooperative. Oh, about that. Just looks over. <laughs> and then he looks over at Barry and he says, See? See, I'm pitching in. Yes, you are. Oh, Thank you for reminding me. She goes ahead and uh, clicks on the radio and sets it to play uh, Barbie Girl over and over again. Very tinny, go. very tinny version <laughs> of Barbie Girl comes through the cheap little radio. There's static drowning out every third word, but it's enough to set the uh, set the appropriate tone. Barry, would you like to handle the interrogation? I'm terrible at these sorts of things. Yeah, I can do that. Mm. Barry, you step up to the torpid sheriff. Even in his current state, Richard is smartly dressed, stunningly handsome. You feel, you feel a strange sense of simultaneous awe and resentment as you wrap your fingers around the stake and rip it out. The room is filled with a sucking sound as it's pulled from the vampire's chest. 
This immediately brings him out of torpor. His eyes flicker to life. Blood and colour rush into his features. And he bares his teeth in a long snarl. Ah! As he looks around, struggles, realises he's utterly trapped. And hisses. Don't be like that. Come on, Bobby, let's go party. Come on, Bobby, let's go party. Oh, oh, oh. You've yeah. made, you've made a big mistake, says Richard. That you anarchs are done. You understand? Oh, you've no. staked and taken the prince's sheriff prisoner and once i get back once i get back and tell the prince what has happened barry punches oh, you go ahead barry barry just punches him in the face oh, crack. Oh, God. your fist strikes his face a point of superficial damage he doesn't get to finish his sentence his head jerks back and then he just bears his teeth bears his fangs in anger and hatred he looks into your eyes, Barry, and he says, What do you want? What were you doing? Mysterious man? slips out. Barry first. What were you doing in Buckley? And then Wisteria? Wisteria slips out and Maiden calls the Baron. What was... Ah, yes. She'll be slipping out while they're interrogating. What was I doing in Buckley? Says Richard. Buckley, Buckley, or at least half of it, and soon the rest of it is a Camarilla domain. I was doing my job. That Tremere turned her back against the pyramid, turned her back against the Camarilla, and Pri Queen Victoria has laid down an edict that all who were once Camarilla, but are no more, are to be brought back into the fold, whether they like it or not. We knew she was working on some mumbo-jumbo with her blood magic, something that could potentially be dangerous, and that night, it just happened to coincidentally be the night when she was working with you. Had you not been there, we would have snatched her, and you would have not have even known what had happened to her. I doubt that very much. And rather than engaging in the spirit of cooperation and letting us have her and proving to me and perhaps to the prince that the Anarchs can be trusted, sometimes you fought for what? For what? For a Tremere apprentice who... <laughs> who cannot even cast a spell correctly. Yeah, I'd honestly rather do that. Than strike a deal with a lowlife like you. <laughs> lowlife? <laughs> lowlife indeed. Ah, uh, oh, policemen always are so forward and brutish, he says. I... I bring an art to it, you see. Investigation is less a science, more an art. <laughs> there's only so far your... There's only so much that your blunt tool methods can go. You see. So now, he says, pulling himself up, trying his best to look dignified even though he's held to the chair by chains and ropes, even though his hair is disheveled and the look in his eyes tells you he's very hungry he tries his best to make himself look sophisticated and dignified and he says, now I'll make a deal with you you tell us what your interest was in Desiree, why you were there last night, and then you will let me and my hound go, and we'll both pretend this never happened. But if you are to lay a hand on me, he gestures over at 
Avelina, if she brings that talon anywhere near me, then there will be no mercy. Do you understand? Gil launches and punches him. <laughs> Bill, Gil, will you be putting some potence behind that punch to really... No, no, it just... He pointed at Avelina and was like, that claw. He's like, oh, sweet, I've got a free game. Crack! <laughs> Gil, go ahead. Make me a strength intimidate check, please, Gil. And to add an extra dice to the pool for Barry's noble efforts already. <clears throat> that says messy critical. Um... <laughs> <laughs> messy critical. So Gil steps forwards. Barry opens his mouth, raises a hand, maybe to stop him. But then Gil clenches his fist, and Gil, as you punch, you feel the beast finally stir. It feels like you're back in the thick of it last night, and what you see down in front of you in that chair is not the Toriador Sheriff. You see that bald skinhead of the mage who set you on fire, staring oh, up at that you, snarling, and yeah. your fist strikes with such force that the whole room is filled with the cacophonous sound of cracking bone and the Toriador's neck snaps <laughs> he screams in obvious pain his entire body twitches and his eyes roll into the back of their sockets as he squirms and gasps for breath <laughs> You, you've done it. Barry's just going to no. come down to, to where he's um, leaned over. <laughs> Shit, yeah, oops. Into his face. It wasn't the claw, so... <laughs> you've done it. You've done it now, Richard says through gritted teeth. See. Taking all of his... Taking every ounce of strength in his body to maintain his consciousness... He's on the. He's just been aroused from torpor and just been thrown right back to the very edge of it. Every word he utters takes an intense effort. He looks up at you, Barry, gritting his teeth, and he just says, "Now you, now you've done it. The prince will not stand." You do, Barry. Would anyone else like to follow up? Oh, that... Cody, we That's might be able... You can... No! Oh, sorry. Yes, uh, uh, sorry, sorry, Cody. Might have to disconnect and reconnect. Sorry. Yeah. You scared the Discord. <laughs> scared, the, <laughs> scared the Discord. It'll tell you anything. Okay, let's... Yeah, uh... yeah no, it's, uh, he'll be back. Okay. There we go. That's better. <laughs> ah, perils right. on the medium. What can okay. you do? Where were we? <laughs> Looks up at you and he squirms. The, the prince will not stand. You know what, Sheriff? I haven't been in this vampire game comparatively long. The Lord of my peers. But there's one thing that I've already picked up that's really gotten on my nerves about the Camarilla. It's that as much as you spout out about I and my Oh. You faded again. Yeah. It's okay, we heard most of it. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> Discord, please. <laughs> we love we love Barry. <laughs> Try again. Try again, Cody. We'll push through. If not, somebody else can pick up the interrogation yeah. and you can you or you can type yeah. your actions in the Discord and we can and uh, the DM can narrate them. Yes, we can do that too. <laughs> yeah. 
Nothing that really gets on my nerves. You have no fucking clue who you are. You are <coughs> in Melbourne. You're in Buckley. You're in our domain. Our territory. So shut the fuck up. Tell us what we want to know. Uh, that's that's what this is. He gasps. <laughs> Animals defending their territory, is that, that what this is? That bitch means nothing to you, other than the fact that she is an anarch, and you all stick together. Is that about the long and short of it? Not necessarily. Long and short of it is, is that we're anarch. We're bound together because we despise you. Now I'm going to do everything in my power to make. Oh, out again to make make your the pie your little castle. I'm going. Mm -hmm. Ooh, very good. Would you like to follow that up with anything? He's already been hit several times, but... <laughs> if not, I would like you to go ahead and make me a manipulation intimidation roll, please. And I will add the number of successes to Gil's one. Oh, manipulation's at the top. Gotcha. Manipulation, intimidation. Oh boy. Ah, uh, just two successes. Two successes. Well, see, there are two things here that are working in your favour. One is that, and you can tell by how sharply dressed he is at all times, Richard is a Toreador, mm -hmm. and right now he's tied to a chair in a dusty room filled with runover from Wisteria's shop. He would normally be trying to use his presence to project him his weight over you to make himself look more imposing and more important than he is, but his clan bane is currently in effect. Mm -hmm. And in addition, in addition... Even though the logical part of him tells him that you won't kill him. You would never do that because that would lead to all-out war. Barry is just unhinged enough that in that moment, in that moment, you're able to make him believe that there is no limit to what you'll do to him. After all, you despise the Camarilla. And they are a long way from home, far from the safety and intrigues of Melbourne. And so he looks up at you, struggling to draw breath, and he says, Fine. Fine. I'll tell you what you want to know. But I want your word. I want your word that you let me go. Tell Dump me, me outside we'll of Anarch territory. We will see spit. Thinks many options run through his mind. Then he shudders. He looks up at Gil, whose fist is still clenched, at Avelina, whose talon is still long and sharp. And Avelina, perhaps at this point, you press the tip of your talon right up at his neck. Not enough to pierce the skin. Just enough to... Just enough so that he feels the pressure of it there. And then he meets Barry's eyes, and he says, What do you want to know? Where's Black? The 
Daniel Black. The Seneschal Black. Seneschal Black spends tonight. He spends most nights in Elysium. At least when he's not carrying out Queen Victoria's special business. And not even we're privy to that. Where he goes, we do not know. But he has a lot of money. He has a lot of connections. And he's working on something. Something that will establish Camarilla superiority. Something that the Anarchs simply cannot stop. No matter how much they punch and scream and kick. Even now, Seneschal Black works. To change this town from the run-down little burg that has languished since the end of the gold rush into a real city with commerce and industry, something that can support the Camarilla and something that will drive the Anarchs away. No art in it, of course, he says. Just money. Lots of money. Lots of backroom deals. Lots of favours. But I can't deny it's working. Even now, your Baron is too afraid to make a proper move against us because he knows. He knows the chips are all in place and should shit hit the fan, Seneschal Black would end the uprising in an instant with the snap of a finger. <clears throat> Is there anything else? He winces. Where are his main holdings? Main holdings, my, my. And at this, Julian steps forwards and the Nosferatu beaming looks down at the sheriff and says, Please speak up. Uh, my clan have been wanting to know for quite some time whether Ventru have their claws in. A church, he says, a church. Friends of the Guiding Light. The Seneschals pumped a lot of money into it, turned it from some group in a community centre into a proper church, built them premises, one here in Buckley and others out of town, turned it from, turned it from something, turned it from a meeting on the weekends to proper organization tax breaks and everything that come along with it hundreds of members constant recruitment and then there's the revitalization of the old banks and the converting of all the old manufacturing and industrial base into trendy apartments the gentrification of course that leaves you anarchs with scant places to hide But right now, he says, it's the church. And there's the funny thing, he says, smiling in spite of himself. There's the funny thing. For there would be no church at all, were it not for one of your own. One of the Baron's own. Seeing the light. But I'm sure your friend Wisteria, he looks around sees that she's not in the room, wherever she may be, understands perfectly who I'm referring to. What's Orson Forrest doing in the back of a van in Buckley? <laughs> well, it certainly makes him seem like a valuable target if he's uh, under so much protection, does it not? The fact is, you need him if you're going to make a move against Wisteria's sire. But if you're going to take him, you'll do it on under our terms, not yours. I 
unless you tell me where Wisteria's sire is. And why would I do that? He says. The best I could tell you is where the church is. Everyone assumes Wisteria's sire has turned it into his haven, but I've been there and I've seen nothing of the sort. For all intents and purposes, it looks like an ordinary, albeit grand, church. I might have only one more question for you, but I'm going to toss it up to the others because I think they might have a few too. So you best be just as willing to comply with them as you are with me, okay? I have your word, he says, I have your word that after this is done, I will be returned to Camarilla territory unarmed. And I, just like I said before, we'll see. This is the clincher. Don't fuck this one up. Where? Go ahead. Where is Bluey? Bluey. <laughs> oh, Bluey! <laughs> he laughs. Each laugh a wince. <laughs> As he wheezes. Oh, Bluey. And what, pray tell, if you will permit me to ask a question of my own, do you Barry's plan to do... By the collar. Bluey, then. Bluey, then. I know where Bluey is, but the question is, would you be able to get to him? <laughs> Tell me. Tell me. You're his child, are you not? Do you see visions, glimpses of futures that could come to pass? And now you know what his purpose is, what he offers to the prince, and as such why she would never, ever leave Bluey out of her sight. Balkavian Primogen, he is a symbolic title, as if there are mayor, as if there are <laughs> enough Malkavians in this city to warrant having a Primogen. As if she would give someone such as him, squirming little weed of a man. Still has mustard gas burns all over his body from before he was a vampire. As if she would give him any measure of real power. But she keeps him close at hand. There at Elysium, calling upon him whenever she has need of his services. But there's something, perhaps, that you don't quite understand, Mr. Marwood, says the squirming sheriff. All these years you've been looking for Bluey, when in fact, the one who really did wrong by your family has been right under your nose the whole time. What are you talking about? The Baron's right hand, of course. You know him. My counterpart in the Anarchs. Although I'd say he's less of a sheriff, more of an enforcer, more of a troubleshooter. I'm talking, of course, of Alexander Pierce. You may have Bluey's blood in your veins, but everything you've been seeking to avenge yourself of for the last 30 years. The culprit's been right under your nose. Don't ask me how. I don't know how. But I go to Elysium. I've spoken to Bluey. And Bluey is in fear of you. He relies on the prince's protection, knows that if he did not have it, you would be on him in a moment, and he is scared. For, he said, in his own words, there is nothing worse than a cop with a chip on his shoulder, especially when he's eyeballed the wrong man. Do 
is just gonna stand up and then turn to the group. Any other questions? Might have a few after the phone call finishes. Mm. So we'll go to Wisteria then. Wisteria, you're standing out in the parking lot. The door to the hotel room is shut behind you, and as you fish your phone out, you hear the winces of pain from Richard. You hear the sound of knuckles colliding with flesh, and you smile, imagining the good time everyone's having behind that door. And then... Fun for the whole family. Then you slide your thumb across the screen, pull up... Baron Wilde's number and dial it. <laughs> Click. And then that familiar, oh so smooth voice. Ah! Wisteria! Ah, oh, Sebastian. I know you're a busy man. Um, we've got a hold of somebody that you probably guessed by now if the fellow the Nosferatu have been doing their thing. I won't go into details. Do you understand who I'm talking about there? You may have heard something from Desiree. Apparently you all had quite a night last night. Yes. Is there anything you would like us to ask the somebody we've got before we turn him loose? I would ask him why he was working with that mortal. I might find that myself was very my question too. curious. Yes, that's the X factor in all this, the thing I can't place. Is there anything else, sir? Aside from that, I have no particular need of a sheriff, especially a sheriff who is one in name only, little more than a lapdog at my of my enemies. My priority is your sire, Thaddeus. I want him dealt with tonight. There yes, can sir. be no other movement against the cam should that not come to pass. All right. Thank you very much. Think you are before you click huh? off. He before you click off. He says you are planning to uh, rough them up. I take it, but not too much. And it would look suspicious if we didn't. On the other hand, it would look very suspicious for him if he were in a good shape, wouldn't it? No, no. They, but... uh, technically, they set foot on our territory, so anything you do to them is nice and legal, as they say. But I would ask, when you're done with them, that you uh, turn them loose somewhere safe so they may find their way home. I won't have that prince accusing me of making the first move That's when they fine. were on our domain. That was my read on the situation as well. Thank you. I'll go and tend to things directly. And then, he says, I presume uh, whether you weasel the location out of Mr. O or out of your captives, you will be proceeding to your sire's hideout. I suspect it's that church you told me about, though until you have confirmation, I would stay well away. Makes sense. Thank you kindly. And she I'll heads on in. I'll send someone to assist, he says, if you don't She pauses, mind. like, the, the third attempt to go through the door, makes little talking no motions with her hands. Glad to hear it, sir. She says, like, checking her watch and back of the phone. They'll know where to find you. Just, uh, when you're about to make your move, do let me know. Of course. And, and he... And, and even Fourth though, attempt at going through the yeah. door. <laughs> and he, 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 t he can tell that you're trying to get off the line, and so he says, Wisteria, we don't have to do it now, but I want to talk to you at some point. You understand this is your sire. Oh, yes. And uh, it was easy enough to figure out after you, you've been dropping clues all over the place, really. He wasn't exiled simply because he and I were both children of Set, you understand. As the snakehead, I want you to know I was happy to have Thaddeus working alongside me. Two can impart the philosophy of Set better than one, can they not? And all that aside, we were both Anarchs, and in Buckley, all Anarchs get a fair go. I want that to be first and forefront in your mind when you go. Well, 
I'll keep that in mind. Thank you. Finally, there's a click and the line goes silent. You step back into the motel room just as Barry's finishing up, answering his last question, uh. and asking about Bluey, and then Richard winces, his neck still at an unnatural angle, wheezing with every breath. He sees you step in, Wisteria, and in spite of himself, his broken mouth twists into the shape of a smile. <laughs> Done, done checking in with your boss, have you? Hmm? Oh, you know how it is. Ah, uh, and you hardly want to talk about bosses. How many do you have? Is it pretty much everyone there that bosses you around? I'm kind of getting that, um, that uh, feeling. You know, the thing about a good sheriff is that he doesn't have to tell you he's a sheriff. Like you did. She walks over to a crate, removes a gorgeous old piece of pottery. Ming, First Dynasty. Wen Chai Wan. We're only surviving peace. From the famous artisan who was once known as the Songbird of Sichuan. And his blood, his blood is in control, no matter how broken and bruised he is, no matter how dire his situation is. The Toreador can't resist, he squirms, shifts his body, his eyes widen as he sets eyes upon it. A beautiful work. And you know, Wisteria, to him, right now, that vase is the brightest, most vibrant thing in the room. Precious. I see a future here, here, she says, turning on the presence. I see a future here where you tell me what I want in very simple, on quick, efficient terms, and you leave with it. But the thing is, what was this man's name? Richard? Richard. Richard. Th Richard, thank you. The thing is, I also see a different future in which case you don't tell me what I want to hear. And she reaches in the bat, in the further end of the box and pulls out a claw hammer. In which case, something beautiful has gone from this world forever, Richard. <laughs> you see him visibly wince. Right in front of your eyes. Well, so let's start by talking about that. Let's start by talking about that bald fellow. Who, who, who's had that trick of lighting his hands on fire. Why don't you start talking about him, and I'll tell you when to stop. Alan Dawes, the mortal. The mage. <laughs> A fortuitous coincidence, nothing more. You see... You see, back... Back in this town's heyday, back when people were still pulling gold out of the earth, the Hermetic Order was... Well, let's just say the Hermetic Order had a lot of weight to pull in this town. Same thing in Melbourne. Hermeticism was quite the rage. But then, then our... Our kind came through, and the rest, as they say, is history. The Hermetic Order have had to operate in secret, quiet, a remnant of what they once were. They recruit on internet message boards, if you'll believe it. But they hold a grudge, you see. A grudge against those of our kind who betrayed them. And if one of the Tremere should uh, happen to steal an artifact from the Hermetic Order, steal several of their materials and spell books on the topic of transmutation because she wants to convert mortal blood into Vitae. See... The prince thought they would make suitable allies. We would approach them, offer them a reasonable measure of power in the New World Order, and they would jump at the chance. It turned out that they'd recently been wronged by one of yours and would stop at nothing to get her back. And so we forge an alliance. You probably broke it now, he says. <laughs> Alan was not expecting that... <sighs> These mages, you can't trust them. You probably, probably 
left him you probably left him at the end of last night realizing that none of us uh, corpses are to be trusted at all and while the order does not have the resources to be anything more than a minor thorn in our side oh, they would have been a useful ally wouldn't they have been uh, hmm. what was that last name again alan alan doors d-a-w-e-s Excellent. How, did he get in contact with you, or did you get in contact with him? I'm using mm. the royal you for the Camarilla, of course. It was I personally, he says. I went to their their coffee shop, their little museum that serves as a front. Oh, I got to see that? the... Why would you go there, he says. Uh, if they you tell me there's a hornet's have... nest in my house, I, w I want to know where it is. And, oh my, this hammer's getting heavy. Smiles. He says, if you wish to seek them out, not that I would at this point after you've established yourself as their enemies and likely soured us all in their eyes, you'll find them up in Atherton. There's a museum, a museum of occult curiosities just off the main street. The man there, a man by the name of Cornelius, poses as the shopkeeper and the curator, but he's one of them. And he'll recognize you for what you are instantly, should you go there. <laughs> Perhaps you would be more interested to know that... Uh, the Seneschal had acquired the services of the mages to assist. The Church of the Guiding Light, you see, once upon a time, that building was an old Hermetic guild hall. It's been retrofitted, and of course, the Seneschal needed them to tell him where all the secret passages were, all the doors, all the old traps that had lane forgotten for gods know how long oh. so you can oh, consider that a joint project of sorts oh, stop now you're just threatening me with a good time ah i tell you no no do go on all right so they uh renovate it for him do you know if they threw in any magic he shrugs that would be between Nathaniel Black and the Majors and, of course, your dear sire. As I'm sure you're aware, your dear sire is the one who has been placed in charge of the whole thing. After all, an upstanding minister like Thaddeus, who's, who would be more suited than to corral a flock of faithful mortals? into our influence. That is something that a lot of us do tend to. The easy way, the sleazy way. And with your three successes on Insight Wisteria, I'd say you have... you have reasonable certainty that he is telling the truth. He's talking... he's sort of reveling in divulging all this stuff. You get a sense of resentment against the Seneschal that the sheriff was kept in the dark about a lot of these things. And he's, in spite of himself, enjoying dropping all of the secrets he's been made privy to right in his enemy's lap. Well, one last question for me, then you're, you're doing very well. You walk out of here with a gift, even. Uh, one last question for me, then I'll turn it to anyone else who has more. How many second inquisition does black have on his tail his eyes go wide as you mention the word second inquisition you all came here from melbourne and i've heard things that never mind should have said listen does black know they're on his tail yet is he really that dense with your three successes in insight and Barry, you 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 recognize this a lot from your days as a detective. The look of utter fear that seeps onto Richard's face is one hundred percent genuine. He stammers for a moment, and then he simply says, "I, 
I don't know. Sure. And, you, and you're sure. doing so well, too. I never said anything. This is about Black. Not about my own individual findings. The prince, he, he assured the rest of us that... That he had evaded their notice. That, that they had been too busy in Melbourne focusing on the kindred that mattered. His sire, Prince Taylor, the others, he got out before the going got hot. He's been here for uh-huh. decades. Got out just before the going got hot, did he? Well, He's out of making... the blast radius when this happened. Hmm? He'd already been in Buckley in your first nights, if you'll recall. He's, uh, was no, no hard matter for him. Simply well, had to relocate a few things and decide to stay here permanently. Perhaps you're right. I suppose he's not insane enough to try call them in to weaken his enemies in Melbourne while he's safely, well, safely here. That would have been foolish. Tell me. Way well, far too arrogant. The Inquisition he, here in Buckley. You, he winces the last words. I you think I'm done. Be... I'll gift wrap your vase for you. <laughs> Anyone else have any questions? Evelina, go. Got anything for him, Evelina? Or Gil? Mm mm. I do not. Then, says Julian, the Nosferatu picks the stake up off the ground and he says, Moving on! And with a flourish, presses his knee down on Richard's body, and as Richard gasps, the Nosferatu feeds the stake back into the hole. That sickening sound, (laughs) like water being sucked down a drain, fills the room. Richard opens his mouth, gurgles something, and then his skin turns grey and stony, and he's torpid once more. Ah, we'll have to drop him along the way. Now. But you have some questions to ask your... You two have some questions to ask that other fellow, I believe. First. Yes, this piece of work, says Julian, running his fingers through each other. He makes his way to the bathroom door and, grinning from one, bat- one bat-like one bat ear to the other <laughs> in anticipation... He grabs the doorknob and pulls it open, revealing Savoy, torpid, chained to the chair on top of cracking, dusted tiles, a backed-up toilet in the background filled behind him filled with misshapen growths and rust and black water. Robert, says Julius. I believe you've got some questions for Savoy here, don't you? And it just so happens, I have a feeling your questions line up quite well with my own. But before you do the honours, he looks over his shoulder at the others. Mysteria, Gil, Barry, Avelina, was it? I don't suppose any of you have any pertinent pieces of info you want to extract from this boy? Now I spent two, two minutes in that man's presence and he made me want to kill something, so now, Thank you, though. <laughs> now beware, Savoy's are obstinate at the best of times. He winks at you, Avelina, and then at you, Gil. If you two would like to be ready, you know. Gil, like, shrug and be like, you know what? Hitting something makes you feel kind of good, so <laughs> let's go. Evelina doesn't really want to waste her claws. <laughs> well, they're out now. <laughs> <laughs> Julian, still smiling, leans over, grabs the harpoon that's sticking out of Savoy's neck and wrenches it with another squelch. <laughs> Savoy lets out a gasp, (gasps) sits bolt upright, his one good eye flickering open, his other eye buried somewhere in the folds of his half-melted face, squirms and tries 
to assert its dominance, but is quickly pushed back down into his skull by a thick organic growth that pokes into the eye socket. He looks around and immediately sets his eyes on Julian and Robert. <laughs> oh, look at you fuckers! You fuckers finally got me, didn't you? You think you're so fucking... You think you're fucking smart, cunts, don't you? Fucking, fucking... I ain't fucking telling you a uh, damn I'm, fucking... I'm going to no. go hunt. Kill <laughs> punch him. Gil I killed him, him already. <laughs> I would like Gil and Avelina to go ahead and make me strength intimidate checks. And Avelina, you may add an extra dice to that pool because you have your claws out. Oh, that's a lot of dice, I okay. guess. <laughs> I success, one crit. Ooh, add Gil? Just three successes. <laughs> There's a bit more restraint this time. The fist comes down, smacks a boy in the chest. You hear a single rib break, but his body doesn't look visibly deformed afterwards, at least. And then, as he whimpers, Avelina steps forwards, places her talon against his neck, and pokes it in, drawing a single drop of blood that rolls down the bony carapace that is the no, top of the torso. You fucking... You fucking bitch! Yeah, you fucking... Fucking, fucking bitch, I'll fucking, I'll fucking get you for fucking... Julian steps forwards, clears his throat and says, Savoy! <laughs> Barking his name, and instantly Savoy is quiet. He looks up at you all like a pedalant child, still muttering under his breath, Fucking cunt, arsehole, fucking, you think get poor Savoy, fucking <laughs> Tell us what we need to know, says Julian. And then he looks over his shoulder at you, Robert. Yes. Yeah, Who is... Yeah, Rudy, child. Rudy, you, you grateful little piece of shit. You fucking... You, you go out and run away from your fucking child. Oh, son, son, you are fucking... You, all you got in this world, you, you only got yourself in this world, eh? You ain't got any fucking friends. You look after your fucking self. Tell us what you know about him. Rudy? You want to know about Rudy? <laughs> Indeed, says Julian. We want to know about Rudy. <laughs> well, fuck, what do you want to know about him? <laughs> you ain't seen your sire before, have you? He says, looking into Robert's eyes. Big bloke, bigger no. than me, taller, built more than fucking, built like fucking brick shit house, fucking. But he, but they call him the red, red fox, you see, the red fox. Because he got a, he, he, he got a bad with the curse, he, he, he fucking, fucking covered in red fucking fur, like, like fucking, like fruit bat, like fucking flying fox. <laughs> We call him the Red Fox, see? Where is he? Says Julian. Yes. Oh, you know. You know, fucking... Fucking, we where the cam need him when they fucking find him. <laughs> and, and, and as you know, being a nos and all, that means you won't find him where he wants you to find him, Capiche? <laughs> but I can tell you, I can tell you at the moment, at the moment he's a bit too shit, chicken shit to show his fucking face what was all going on with his fucking, <laughs> fucking mistake he made. Shit, one child ran out on him, became an anarch, and the other one tried fucking killing me. <laughs> throws back his head and laughs like a maniac. He... he sired another child. Yeah, he... he thought you were the only one, didn't you? He, he, he thought you were the yeah. only one. 
But he didn't have any intention of fucking. He didn't have any any fucking intention of bringing you in into, into the circle. Yeah. No, he made the prince. Prince gave him a boon. See, information sharing. He's the spy master. You see, <laughs> he's the spy master. She she gave him a fucking boon. She did so. He hand picked one of his own retainers, and he embraced her. Only only curse didn't take, did it? <laughs> Ends up. Ends up with a child, and she looks completely human, completely normal. Uh, a little bit of red fur on the back of the hands, they say. <laughs> Aside from that, you won't have to hide her face, nothing. Not for R2 in name only. So he says, he says, I ain't having no caitiff. I ain't having no caitiff as my kid. <laughs> so he says, and so she, she fucks off, didn't she? But she tried to kill him. She tried to kill him. Before she made it a runner, right? But she couldn't do it because you didn't just knock off the red fox. You don't fucking knock off the red fox like that. And who knows where the bitch is now, eh? <laughs> mm. The more you speak, the less useful you're proving yourself. Julian turns to you, Robert, frowning. He says, hmm. I've been trying to find out how we could get a mean get an in on your sire for a while. See, you heard it straight from uh the horses, uh the cigarette butt's mouth, I should say. Is become the become the prince's spy master, which means he's essentially turned his back on the rest of his clan. There are some who want him brought back into the fold. At least talk it out with him. And I'd heard he'd had some trouble over on the cam side of things. So a kitiff <laughs> child, you say? Yeah, yeah, fucking, fucking Katie fucking look human. Yeah, fucking, <laughs> don't look like us. You know, when any, anyone fucking bitch think, bitches up herself, thinks she don't fucking look like us, and she fucking much better, fucking better than any of us. Fucking bitch. Yeah, yeah, says Julian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we know she's out there, don't we? He turns to you, Robert, smiling, and he says, <laughs> Up to you. But I've still got some ties with the old crowd. I can get the word, word out, I can ask around, get the information floated around in the cam part of town. Maybe we can find out uh, what became of this second child. What say you? Uh, yes, I think a family reunion's in order. Shall be done. <laughs> he smiles down at Savoy. And that's all, all I want from you, Savoy. Does anyone else have any other questions? Gil kind of looks between the, uh, well, four of them in the room, and uh, then looks at the boy. Like, can I just beat on him for a bit? Just for, more like... keeps cutting out. Sorry. Okay, go ahead, Gil. I can hear you. You want to spit on him for a bit? I just want to beat on him for a bit. Just, just lay into him for a few minutes. You know. No one protests as Gil steps forward. Mm. Thwack into Savoy's rib and thwack into an arm. <laughs> the whole... Savoy laughs. He doesn't wince in pain. He laughs. Yeah, yeah, bring it on, you fucking... Ah, fucking bring it, yeah, fuck. And when Gil is done, he's not saying anything at all. He's just laughing. <laughs> He'll, like, motion to Adelina and, like, can I, can I bring your hand for a second? I just want to see something. Felina does so. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cool. He'll like just, just like start gently moving her hand towards his neck, like the, the claw. And then like if she doesn't resist, he'll fake a sneeze and just like put it through his neck. <laughs> like, oh shoot! Oh shit! Sorry, sorry. God! Ah, screams Savoy. The oh, blood shit. spurts from his neck. He coughs. <laughs> yes, fucking yes. Yee! Can't! It's 
the last word he spits before his eyes roll back into the sockets and he the last drops of blood in his body evacuate onto the floor and his body hardens drops forwards limp over the chains torpid Oh, God. Someone. <laughs> oh, that felt good. You guys feel good? I feel good. I need a drink. Julian gestures towards Savoy, whose blood even now is leaking like a faucet onto the floor. If you don't mind polluted water. Oh, mm-hmm. fuck my God. I'm drinking that shit. <laughs> no offense, guys. We're like, um, no, 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 not him. Nah, no, it's it's the, it's not the Nosferatu bit. It's the Camarilla bit. Like, come on. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> says Julian. Sure. <laughs> Although, if I were bleeding, I'd be willing to bet money you wouldn't find my blood that appetizing either. You know, spending all your time living in sewers and parks does do something to the taste. Yeah. God. All right. Sure. Look. I'm just going to go hunt, because, like, I, need, I, I feel like I deserve it now. I feel good. <laughs> Julian nods. He says, hey, feel free. Uh, anyone want anything else out of these guys? Oh, maybe a bit too late to ask that. Uh, you want them returned, mm. right? Safely back to... <sighs> Wisteria oh, yes. wants, wants them returned, and I Wisteria want them out in the sun, and, like... I don't know, man. Look. Was it, was it both of them returned, or just the sheriff? Oh, I'll take half. Come on, that's a great deal. Who wouldn't want 50% back? Can Wisteria feed in at this point? She can. Alright, she didn't go on. She just got out of earshot because, oh my god. Alright. <laughs> She's Are like, you ah, she... Yes, I had to gift wrap this. She holds up the vid. Va- the vase now in a bright, cheery box, with an mm-hmm. anarchy symbol on the side. Um, yes, uh, are you finished with? Oh dear, looks like you are. Let's return yep. the let's return the very cooperative man and the nasty little man to their proper place. Julian, did you have any ideas, or do you want us to drop him off on our way? Julian smiles. He says, "I can take care of it. Consider that my boon repaid." Don't worry, I'm not going to be saying anything to anyone about magic men or any of the shit that was coming out of his mouth. I just wanted to know what was going on with old Rudy. I think it might be useful if I were to do something, though. By all means, says Julian, flourishing, gesturing towards the two torpid vampires. Cloud of minds. (laughs) Aveline peels their eyelids open. There's nothing underneath, nothing but blood, nothing but compacted blood and gristle, but she whispers it the same. Forget. They'll remember they were captured. They'll remember they were interrogated, of course, but... Hey, they won't remember my face, says Julian, smiling. And with luck, they won't remember yours. So, uh... What do you say? Dump them back I in Cam tor- territory or make them work for it? I, I'll oh. back in Cam territory and make sure that uh, the Nosferatu on the Camarilla side know that Richard walked out of here with a present. <laughs> for being a good boy. <laughs> Julian reaches I'm... out and he takes the Ming Vask, the Ming Vase, and he smiles and he says. I'll rest up. You won't miss it? I... The joy is not in the having, the joy is in the taking. It's a trophy and it served its purpose, and if I want it, I'll just take it back. Yeah, and I'm sure, I'm sure he'll have no problem. (laughs) I'm sure uh, he won't put up much of a fight if you do decide to take it back. Hmm. Well, it's been a pleasure, Julian. Yeah, Avelina, you were saying something, I think? Mm-mm. Okay. Yeah. One last. Go ahead. If Rob. we, if we may, we would ask for just 
a brief moment with Savoy before we sell him back. By all means, says Julian. Come, come. He f- holds the vase <laughs> under one arm and with the other arm grabs Wisteria by the hand and begins to lead her and the rest of the <laughs> coterie towards the door. You slip she into the... hand without hesitation. Julian's friend. He is a friend. Robert, you slip into the rundown bathroom, and Savoy's still there, still chained to the chair. His throat is cut wide open. There's a couple fresh dregs of blood still pouring out, but for the most part, he's completely dry, indistinguishable from a corpse. So it's not, not looking like I can get a drink from him. Mm, don't say no. Any blood that's left of him is... Any blood that's going to be left in him is going to be, like, little drops inside the veins, in the twistiest, turniest parts of his body, deep inside. Do you really and want to be so, bound to Savoy? It just so happens you have, a, you have a means of scouring the little inaccessible places, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> uh... Yeah, we'll see if there's... Just give him a check over, see if there's any blood left in him. Yeah. It's been a while right. since he's had kindred vite, and it seems like a good moment. <laughs> Will you be employing your ants to do this? Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, do a rouse check and roll your animal whispers for me. Uh, they are my familiars, so it's free. It is free, yes. Go ahead, roll your animal whispers. Do, do, do. One thing I forgot to do is so he can get his powers up. <laughs> Feral whispers, that is charisma animalism. How do we go? Well, I suppose I'll do a critical six. Six? What hunger are you currently at? Uh, one. One. Oh, wow. Definitely going to be no chance of a frenzy here. Even... Well, <laughs> I had some ideas. You do have some ideas. Even... Yeah. Even Julian squirms visibly as the ants begin to move, as your cheeks... <laughs> Squirm and vibrate as the ants move under your skin. You open oh, your I mouth. Think it's time to go, Julian. Don't you? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh... <laughs> he steps out of the door, leaving Robert utterly alone. As Robert's mouth opens, and instead of his tongue, a long black stream of ants twists slowly out. As soon as as soon as they're on top of Savoy's body, they scatter. Their many legs and pincers burrowing into the folds of his skin, into the holes, into the cracks beneath his broken bones, into the deepest parts of his vessels. And Robert stands still, holding out his hand as one by one the ants emerge, each of them carrying a tiny droplet of congealed blood. You're already at hunger one, Robert. There's not a lot of blood in him. Mm. Any you take now will simply grant you a resonance that won't affect your hunger, but but as the ants... Dour his body for every trace of Vitae within. You can go further if you like. And no one else is in the room to stop you. Yeah. Do you do it? Uh, well, so basically, just to make this a little more interesting, I was effectively planning on basically treating this like it was a hunger, a hunger frenzy risk. Mm. Like It's probably been a while since he's had top of... Uh, Kindred Vitae, so he's probably still at the verge of a risk of, yeah, mm. losing it a little and giving into it. Well, being that you're at Hunger One, I'll say it's entirely up to you whether you would like to induce yourself into a hunger frenzy. 
<laughs> you know you shouldn't, but... Mm. But human blood. You have the Methuselah's thirst floor. Human blood never quite hit the spot. Oh, it feeds the ants. And their happiness is what means the most to you, but... In all your time as a vampire, you've rarely ever had that feeling of it hitting the spot of the beast being purely unmistakably satisfied and withdrawing quiet until the next time and right now as the ants feed the droplets of blood down your throat and carry them directly into your veins the beast anticipates what is to come do it! Do it! Do it! You've waited so long, you've worked so hard, you've earned it, haven't you? You're a monster, nothing wrong with that, nothing wrong with acting like a monster. What does Robert do? Yes, it's With the effort. It's time. I think time we deserve a reward. Yeah, keeps drinking, keeps drinking inside Savoy's body. Ants scour for every trace of blood they can find. Robert stands there silently, still. The beast purring as each sickly sweet drop of blood is brought into your body. And then, then it stops. The ants stop bringing blood. Then they begin to bring bits of rotted meat, shards of bone, something even more ephemeral than the blood itself. And that's when the beast roars. And in spite of yourself, Robert, you find not the ants, but you moving, your fangs bared. You sink them into the tear on the throat that Avelina made and you drink. Drink what? You're not sure. His body is dry, an empty husk. It feels like it's going to break apart in your hands, reduce to ash and powder, but there is something coming out, something sweeter than any blood you've had before. You can, you swear you can feel your heart beating in its chest, something it hasn't done in 30 years. You swear you can feel his heart beating. You can feel the hearts, the thousands of hearts of the ants that crawl in you, each of them quivering with anticipation as you begin to diabolize his soul. The beast roars in pleasure. The pleasure is so intense that it drowns the beast out. There is no bathroom, no motel room, just you and him in a white void that stretches on forever. Somewhere in the distance you can hear the chiming of an ephemeral bell, and as you drink, as you drink you can hear Savoy scream and swear and spit and curse your name as his soul begins to fight back. This is your last chance to withdraw, if you'd like to. Nope. Keep going. <laughs> the ecstasy filling every fibre of your being. You could hear Savoy in your head, his shouts intermingling with those of the ants, those of the beast. F fuck, no, don't! Fucking, you can't fucking take it. I'm not gonna let you fucking take it. Fuck, 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 fuck. But you keep going. Robert, I'd like you to roll your humanity plus your blood potency, please. And it will be, okay. and it will go against one, his resolve and his blood potency. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Yeah, 12th gens are still only potency 1, aren't they? Yep, start at 12. 12th gen starts at blood potency 1. Okay. 
How many successes do we go? So just out of curiosity, is this a role you can willpower? Power this if you like, as many times as you want. Yeah. I, didn't, I don't think I did too bad, but it's just, I can always use more. <laughs> I know what happens if this goes poorly. <laughs> I have experienced that. <laughs> Yep. Tremere gun to Tremere. This could go very poorly. That's right. I do remember what Derek did. Yeah. Took me two down times to get back to where I was. Oh. Yeah, let's push one more willpower just to reroll these last two. <laughs> yeah. Alright, that'll two, three. Uh, that'll bring me to a grand total of eight successes. Thump, 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 thump. The heartbeat grows louder, stronger, intermingling with the chiming of that distant bell and the scream. Savoy's desperate attempts to fight for his soul recede. They grow quieter as the beast in your head roars in triumph as a thousand insect voices chitter in anticipation. And then suddenly you're back in the bathroom withdrawing your fangs from Savoy's throat, letting out a deep, satisfied breath. <sighs> it feels... Feels like... Feels like lighting up a durry for the first time in the morning. Feels like that time-honored ritual of flooding your veins with nicotine. Fuck yeah! <laughs> says a voice in your head. Guess we're, guess we're best fucking friends forever, aren't we? <laughs> and Savoy is part of you. Reduce your humanity by one, please. In addition, he got three successes on his roll. How many was it you got? Eight. Eight? Yeah. That will be... 40 points of experience for you. Holy yes, shit. Yes, we. <laughs> Savoy, however is a 12th generation vampire. You do not get a boost to your generation or your blood potency automatically. Eh. But he's now part of you. Just another voice in the crowd. Chittering ant voices calling for yet more <laughs> blood and somewhere among them that tiny voice. Fuck yeah! And the sound of a big lighter lighting a <laughs> cigarette. The rest of you stand in the parking lot. Julian has managed. Julian bids farewell. Vars under one arm, and Richard's torpid body slung over his other. He turns and disappears into the darkness. And then, after a few minutes, after the terrified screams, after those bestial, animalistic cries, stop ringing out from inside the motel mm. room. The door creaks open and out shuffles Robert, his eyes clear, filled with satisfaction and purpose. He moves slightly differently. He's no longer shuffling around on edge. This moment, you're seeing Robert for perhaps the first time in 20 years unplagued by the hunger, unplagued by the beast. He looks good. There's something sinister, something <laughs> about the way he looks around, the way his eyes glimmer in the moonlight and in the light of the streetlights. 
There's something about him. Is he slightly taller? Is he standing up straighter? No, no, it's it's the ants. It's always the ants. Even now you can see them moving under the skin of his arms, under his cheeks. And Wisteria smiles at something in her blood. Sighs and temptation. And then she gets an image of serpents twining around an apple. <laughs> He has been tempted. Barry mm. stares off across the parking lot at where his car is. The windows covered in garbage bags to block out the sun during the day. And with purpose, without saying anything, Barry strides across the parking lot, stands in front of his car, and looks over his shoulder. We're going after Mr. Rowe? He says. It looks like. I'm guessing he told you it was an obvious trap, yes? Seems so, he says. But he's not banking on the fact that I know exactly where he is. Oh, this is going to be fun. I love a challenge. Still got those rental cars. Shall we? After you, says <laughs> Barry, as he slides into the front seat of his car and the engine well, me... roars to life. No, literally, you've got the tracking hanky, so after you. Ah, well. <laughs> <laughs> and he leads you off to your quarry. But first... Does anyone feel the need to hunt before you go after Mr. Rowe? Do you feel the need to go after Mr. Rowe at all? After all, based on what Richard said, you can make a... You could probably locate the church. You could... You probably have enough to go on to declare that the church is your destination, but Mr. O would be the clincher. I have my thoughts on it. Mm. I'm sure Barry would like mm. to do it. The more evidence, the better. What do you all think? I think uh, I think going after him is probably a really good idea. I mean, one less piece in the puzzle. That's Barry smiles precisely. Doesn't matter if all the evidence is pointing towards one outcome. You need to make sure there's not a shadow of a doubt. He hunches over the steering wheel as the engine roars. He says, I'll get a bead on him. I'll give you a call when I've got him in my sights. Robert and Aveline. Yeah. Are you fine with this course of action as well? I am fine with that. Alright. Oh, fuck you, mate. <laughs> <laughs> this. Oh, please this. spare me. <laughs> This causes Barry to raise an eyebrow at Robert, and he says, mm. You never quite answered my question about what happened to you. We'll have to talk about it sometime, lay it all out on the table, because you are not what you were all those years ago. And then his car rolls mm. out of the parking lot, and moves into the darkness, an animal out on the prowl, a predator on the hunt. And before we wrap up for this session, would anyone like to do any hunting while they wait for Barry to get a bead on Mr. O? Yes. Gil is going to go hunting around the bars because he feels like he deserves a treat. He does. Anyone else? In lieu of hunting, could Wisteria lay in a contingency plan, an undeclared action that she could use to do a narrative twist if something weird happens during the Mr. O grab? Grounds do you have? Hmm. Do you have resources? Do you have any contacts? Yeah, ma Mafia contacts. Hmm. Mm. Go ahead. 
Pull your resources and your contacts together and roll them, please. Right. If you get at least three successes, I'll say Wisteria can spend this time planning a contingency plan. They're trying to be a little mastermind. Uh, the dice said nah. Oh well. I'll Not allow you to. Success. I'll allow you to get it a full success if you like. I'll allow you to get the three successes, but you'll have to permanently burn a dot of resources. Funnel some, uh, pump some money into it. I'm still saving that up for my plan with Black, so. You manage to get Dominic on the phone, and you tell him that you're in the mood for procurement, and that somebody out there's got a debt that they need to pay, and he's very apologetic. He's just like, "Oh man, uh, look, I'm sorry, Wiss. I'm sorry. Oh uh, look, all the uh, all the standover men. Uh, something big going on with the blokes in Melbourne. Uh, look, if you needed cars, I could give you cars. If you needed a place to lie low, I could give you that. But we just ain't got any boots on the ground tonight." Mysteria is not happy with them, but she does her best not to show it. Stiff up a lip and all that. <laughs> and That's then... It. Gil. Lakeside's not too yeah. far from the rack. Even oh. Gil doesn't want to poach on anyone else's territory, so he clambers into his car, makes the journey down to the CBD, down to the rack, and begins to prowl the maze of clubs bars and trendy cafes in and that form a constant perimeter around the botanical gardens early tonight still not shy of 10 30 p.m but already the places are pumping loud bass throbs in the streets and several of the businesses already have lines of people waiting to be admitted you are, of course, an alley cat, are you not? He certainly is. Hmm. So I'd like you to go ahead and roll me. Depending on what type of prey you're looking for. Do you want to enter a bar, try to chat someone up, or are you looking for someone who just happens to be alone in the right place at the right time, in, on the streets, in an alleyway? Gil's looking for someone who's already had a few drinks. Already had a few drinks. So he's All right. be, if he can't find anyone on the street, he'll definitely like get his way into the bar. Right. I'll ask you then to go ahead and make me a, a wits plus streetwise check. Hey, that's a neat four successes. Four successes. Thankfully, you don't have to enter a bar. Even at this time of night, there's always those who like to get started early. You spend 10, 15 minutes prowling the streets, watching people through the window of your car, watching to see if anyone's staggering around, if anyone's walking with that telltale drunkard's gait. And sure enough, Coincidentally, about a block away from the Black Shame, in fact, Avelina's nightclub, you find what you're looking for. A dive bar. A dive if you've ever saw one. The sign reading the Red Room has faded with decades of grime and misuse. Only the two big R's in Red and Room are visible. You have to squint to see the other faded words. The locals seem to be giving this dive bar a wide berth, and that suits you well, because as you park your car and wait, sure enough, somebody steps out. Somebody pushes their way through the thick wooden double doors and begins loudly whistling as they fish a phone from their jacket pocket and stagger into the mouth of a nearby side street that runs alongside a city park. The beast kicks into high gear and your muscles seemingly moving of their own accord 
cause you to rise from the seat, step out of the car and follow. And as you close in on this evening's target, as you step into that winding cobblestone street that runs alongside the city park, you swear, you feel a piece of paving stone give way, crack under your foot. You stumble, fall hard, just as you were about to pounce, crashing at the feet of your prey with your teeth bared and a look of murder in your eyes. And while your prey is surprised, while your prey is surprised, while the drunk, while the heavily intoxicated man stands there still, taking a few seconds to process that you mean to attack him, he's all too ready to teach you the danger of preying on strangers. He fumbles around, grabbing a brick from the top of a dumpster beside him, raises the brick. And he says, you come any closer and I'll fucking throw it. A drink and a fight. Awesome. Um, Gil will, um, <laughs> Gil will launch, uh, and cause le- he's got lethal body and this guy's immortal. So this is going to. He's going to hurt the poor guy. Um, so he's just going to go for like a... Lethal body is of course passive. You don't get a choice whether you want to apply it for more yeah. or not. Um, he'll just go for like a, a, a jab to the shoulder to like... Just give this guy a, a ruined shoulder. <laughs> You're vaguely aware of your own shoulder still wincing, still stinging underneath. Abby's lovingly applied dressings, that aggravated damage still not fully healed, and then you move, letting out a, opening your mouth and letting out a roar as the beast does so. Full animal mode. Go ahead and make me a strength brawl check, please. The man stumbles, wavers back and forth on the spot as he raises the brick over his head, both hands clasped around it. And That's another four successes. Four successes? Four successes to his four successes. He's heavily intoxicated. You can tell. You can see it in his face. You can see it in his eyes. But... As he sees you charging towards him, as he sees this monster bearing down, as he sees your fangs, as he hears the roar of the beast, his fight or flight response kicks in and he screams as he hurls the brick forwards. You leap forwards, wrapping your arms around him, pinning him to the ground as you raise your right fist and boom, bring it down, slamming it into his shoulder. You feel the bone disintegrate under your under the weight of your hand hear the man scream in pain as the brick drops down slams into the side of your shoulder sending pain reverberating down your body you take a single point of aggravated damage and what is your hunger currently at currently at two two Superficial, one point of superficial, I, I accidentally said aggravated, I think, and you're at two hunger, you pin him down, deliver another punch to his shoulder, and he screams once more as his arm bends out, sticking in an unnatural direction, and as he fumbles for a piece of concrete on the ground, you sink your fangs in, and he's paralysed. His body shivers, shakes, and his cries of pain turn into slow murmurs. And the beast roars, rattling its cage. As the pain from your burnt shoulder shoots through your body, the beast calls upon you to take it, take it all. Dare he take it all. Make him pay for causing you pain. 
as a gnat strikes against. As a gnat attempts to strike against that which would cull it. So, uh... What do you do? Can I make another rouse check to heal that superficial as I'm feeding so that I can take two points from him? You sure can. Go ahead, make the rouse check. Hey, success. I don't need to uh, worry about taking too much from him. But he'll, um, as he's feeding, he'll heal that back up and... and the won't take as much. The throbbing pain from where the brick struck you fades, dulls, fades, and then is gone, leaving only the lingering sting of the burn. And with that, you take hold of your faculties, force the beast back into its cage, and rip your fangs out, leaving the semi-conscious man gurgling, wincing in pain at your feet. Instantly, you feel the alcohol kick in, the lingering pain in your shoulder instantly disappears as the buzz takes over, flooding you. And all Hell yeah. is well. Hell yeah, Gil says. What do you do with the man when you're done? Um, he'll toss him behind the dumpster um, and kind of leave him. Mm. Drop him behind the dumpster, swift, swift kick to his groin area, and then you lift his wallet out of his pocket. Take a 20 out of it, that's all that's in it, drop it back in the dumpster. It'll look like a particularly violent mugging, but certainly nothing supernatural. And then, as you feel your phone beginning to vibrate in your pocket, as Barry calls the coterie to signal that that he's ready to make a move on Mr. O. Gil smiles, his purpose renewed, and sets off back down the cobblestone path into the night. And that's where we'll leave it. Awesome. Well done, guys. That will be two experience for each of you this session. Heck yeah. <laughs> These are Much... probably easily the most evil characters we've played. Yeah, much more for <laughs> Robert. Mu definitely yeah. much more for <laughs> Robert. And next time, we make a move on Mr. O, and then on Thaddeus the Sedite at the Church of the Guiding Light. And that, my dear little monsters, is when the shit will well and truly hit the fan. <laughs> Creatures Such As We is a Vampire the Masquerade 5th Edition Actual Play Podcast presented by DM Fiat. Creatures Such As We is based on a source book by Brian Holland, available at the Storyteller's Vault. Vampire the Masquerade Rules are developed by Onyx Path Publishing and Paradox Interactive and published by Renegade Studios. Portions of the materials are the copyrights and trademarks of Paradox Interactive AB and are used with permission. All rights are reserved. For more information, please visit worldofdarkness.com. The music used in this podcast is composed by Kevin McLeod, Whitebat Audio, and Ivan Duke and is used with permission. <laughs> <laughs>